For these people. Um, no reparations for you. Um, no, you well. can't have. Um, so Tulsa race massacre court tosses reparations case, right? So this is, um, Ariana Campo Flores and Jennifer Kalfos. Where exactly is this from? I have it in the description, right? Um, it is Wall from, Street Journal. Yeah, Wall Street Journal. You're correct. Um, so an Oklahoma judge dismissed a lawsuit brought by three survivors of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre who sought reparations for the attack on the city's Greenwood district at the time, one of the wealthiest black neighborhoods in the U S Tulsa County district judge, Carolyn wall dismissed the case filed against defendants, including the city of Tulsa and the Tulsa region and chamber with prejudice Friday, according to a court docket entry dismissing with, uh, with prejudice means the case can't be refiled, but it is impossible, but it is possible for the decision to be appealed. Okay. So that judge should be hanged. Uh -huh. She should be hanged. Uh huh. The victims of the Tulsa race massacre were denied reparations, even though they were harmed by the massacre. This is how the U.S. feels about black people, says Jay Buffont, friend of the show, RBN member. Um. Anyway, I'd like I'd like one of you to tell the people at home who don't know, um, what exactly was the Tulsa race massacre? Because I know they don't teach that in schools, so. No, they don't. They're trying to get rid of it in Florida because Ron DeSantis wants to eliminate anything that involves telling the truth about what happened to black people in America. That's what happened. But yeah, Tulsa race massacre happened in 1921. Angry mob of white people saw a group of black people in the historic Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, doing quite well. They had homes, their own schools, their own businesses. And an angry group of an angry mob of white people decided to burn down all these buildings, burn down all the properties. Millions of dollars of wealth was lost. The area was never be able to rebuild again. And the United States government has consistently denied the not only the people who suffered the direct losses of their property reparations and indemnification, but obviously the descendants and remaining survivors that we're talking about right now for reparations are some sort of some sort of restitution or indemnification. America does not have a problem paying reparations. America has a problem with paying reparations to Black people. Right. America has never had a problem paying reparations. Take a look at the, the Japanese that they put in internment camps. Take a look at Native Americans. Take a look at the reparations that were paid to Jewish people. America has no problem paying reparations, and we certainly know America has the money. America has a fundamental problem with paying reparations to Black people in this country, and it's a problem. And the lady we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, she should have received reparations. So should her, other members of her family. So should other members others of, of other survivors. So should their families should have been receiving reparations. And that was not, and by the way, everyone talks about that being with Black Wall Street. There were plenty of Black Wall Streets around the United States, not too far away from where I live in Durham, North, not too far away from here in Durham, North Carolina. There's a street in Durham, North Carolina called Parish Street. It, Parish Street is a Black Wall Street. There's a large plaque right there, and there's one of the one of the oldest black banks in the United States called M and F Bank, Merchants and Farmers Bank. It's located right there on Parish Street in downtown Durham, North Carolina. It's a black Wall Street. There are plenty of these nexuses of black wealth around the United States. There were plenty of black Wall Streets in the United States. There's still high concentrations of black wealth around the United States. One of the highest concentrations of black wealth around the United States is the Capitol Beltway area, not too far away, not too far away from where you are, Colin. Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Prince William County, Loudoun County, high concentrations of black wealth. Why? Government jobs. Government jobs are designed to be anti-discriminatory. You can't discriminate in the hiring practices in a federal government job. Plus, at the time, 
many of those jobs that were good paying jobs with high benefits and labor unions to protect workers' rights for the federal government employees, they were good paying jobs. And you didn't necessarily need a college degree to get a good paying job. So you could work, you know, as a secretary at the United States Census Bureau off of Suitland Avenue in Suitland, Maryland. And let's say your husband's a mail carrier for the Postal Service in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. It's 1982, you buy a house for seventy-five dollars or $80,000 and you both are two wage earning people making good money with government jobs. You have a group of other people that are doing the same thing in your area. That's how you build a concentration of black wealth. That's how you get a quote unquote black Wall Street in the current day. That's how you get it. That's how it happened a hundred years ago. You were able to acquire land. You were able to have businesses. You kept the black dollar within black businesses so the dollar would circulate in the black community. You don't have that now. White people were able to see that these black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in other black areas were doing quite well and decided to quash this, crush that. And that's what happened. By the way, on a musical note that's somewhat related to what we are talking right, talking about right now, I'm sure you all are familiar with an R&B group called the Gap Band. Right? Yeah. Gap. Outstanding. Okay. Gap band. The Speaking word. Of the mic. Yeah. You're okay. closer to the, the mic. word gap. Sorry about that. The word. Yeah. The word gap. It's actually not the word gap is in a space. It's actually an acronym. It stands for Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. Greenwood, Archer, and Pine were three of the streets from the historic Greenwood neighborhood in the Black Wall Street area of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Why? Because the Gap Band were from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Just a fun musical fact that I wanted to share with everybody. Yep. There's another, um, I'm trying to remember the show, the, the one of the Watchmen series did an incredible, uh, like, live action, like, representation of the, you know, massacre there that people should check out if their stomachs are strong enough. Um, you know, it's pretty wild, um, even in that watered down version. So, sure. um, but you know, they threw bombs out of planes. People it was pretty fucked up. Um, but anyway, I have, uh, another friend of the show, Sabrina Salvati, um, with Dr. Darity and Kristen Mullins. And they were talking about reparations. When was this Colin? Um, I believe this was two weeks ago and that she, I'm not sure what voodoo she was able to do to get Dr. Darity on, but she did it. Uh, but Joe, you, he was one of your professors, correct? No, no, he wasn't one of my professors. No, no. But I've, I've, I've read his book. Right. From Equality. And in the summer of 2020, when there was this mass rush for, from quite honestly, white people towards black people saying, Hey, look, how can I be a better ally? How can I, how can I do right by black people? How can I be a better white? And there's a lot of black people that that had happened. And I was one of them had that happened, had, had happened to me. And people were like, wait, what resources, what are there? Some of the books I should read. And there were two books that I automatically said that everybody should read. One is when affirmative action was white by Dr. Ira Katz Nelson. And the other was, from Here to Equality by Dr. Sandy Darity and his wife, Kirsten Mullen. It's an important book. It talks about reparations for Black people, Black Americans in the 21st century. Quite frankly, it's it's it should this should be the kind of text that middle school and high school courses should be based upon. Not just- Or I would give, I'll do one better if you're teaching yeah. African-American studies. See, and I wasn't, see, Colin, you see, and it's interesting you said that. I wasn't necessarily even going to say African American studies. I was going to say history, history. And economics, not just yeah. African American studies. And these are already really, banned a, in Florida, right? <laughs> it has to be banned in Florida. <laughs> and talk about Black people in Florida. Mm -hmm. But yeah, African American studies, absolutely. But quite frankly, African American history is also a part of American history, yeah. and there's no. And quite frankly, if 
if America lived up to the ideals that all quote unquote men are created equal, we really wouldn't need a black history and what now, would we? We no. wouldn't need African American now, would we? No. Because everybody would be treated equally, right? But I understand the need for this because we live in a racist country. America was built on racism, founded on racism, and runs on racism. So now, in order to make sure that we have equal representation for, for history of Black people in this country, sure, we need a Black History Month. It just happens to be the shortest month. Shortest year, month. That's a yep. Sounds of Paul Mooney echo in my head. <laughs> you know. Well, it's true. Uh, it's 28, 29 on the leap year. Yep. But yeah, the, the, again, read the book. There's a magnificent historical perspective on the continued impoverishment of Black people in the United States, starting from slave enslavement, freedom's, Freedmen's Bureau, 48 acres and a mule, reconstruction, redlining, Jim and Jane Crow, mass incarceration, and now what needs to be done to remedy the harm that's been caused by by towards black people for ever since August 20th, 1619. An institution of racism and slave and enslavement that is older than the United States is as an independent uh, nation. Huh? That's the thing. We're not the only ones who should be given reparations out. You know, there's there's quite a few, you know, trading companies that might have some money left over to give. Right. Um, well, yeah. So, so anyway, we'll watch. Go ahead. We'll watch, like maybe, I think a few, definitely a few minutes. We're not gonna watch a whole thing because it's an hour. But yeah. uh, actually, need to finish watching this. But please, um, as you should, especially for those, if Black Lives Matter, watch this. Yep. And you can learn how to be a great ally to black people when it comes to this subject. So oh, look at my African American over here. Look, like you know, just do it. Look at look at these. You know, another um, way that the federal government disadvantaged black Americans uh, was by watching um, a series of massacres that took place uh, across the country uh, of black communities. And so we're talking about, you know, moments when black people who were actively engaged in politics, you know, who were ex exercising the right to vote uh, or who were simply, um, uh, you know, successful in life, uh, you know, who had material, who had managed to acquire uh, material wealth were the targets of jealous white people. Um, and we see this pattern, you know, we have documented up, you know, over now 100 massacres that took place between uh, Reconstruction and the end of World War II. You know, many of your um, audience members may be familiar with Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah. uh, the massacre that took place in 1921, largely because uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden both went to Tulsa um, during the 100 year anniversary. Um, you know, and we often say, you know, somewhat cynically uh, in many ways, the reason why we know about these incredibly successful black communities is that white people destroyed them. Um, you know, you know, or people will say, oh, you know, Wilmington, North Carolina uh, was the first, you know, was the only coup, you know, the only the only place in the country where um, duly elected, you know, legally elected officials were removed from office. Uh, and this was in 1898. But we have uh, documented at least six such moments when that happened. Uh, the earliest of which was uh, in Cushada, uh, Louisiana, Colfax, actually, Colfax, Louisiana, 1873, uh, Cushada, 1874. Um, and, you know, what we're what we're seeing, too, is that there were, you know, basically playbooks that these white people used uh, in these attacks. So we mentioned Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, where, you know, massacre killed hundreds of black people. Uh, and there was a mass exodus of the black population. And for the next 60 or 70 years, the, the white Democrat Party, which in those days um, was more akin in ideology uh, to the Republicans of today, they mm -hmm. ruled for another 60 to 70 years. Uh, and the black population just drops tremendously uh, as a consequence of this massacre. Um, but we learned that in Fort Bend County, Texas, 
which is near where my uh, maternal grandfather was raised, um, in 1888-89, so 10 years prior, um, the white people, you know, the white Democrats uh, drafted what they called a white men's uh, declaration of independence. And they spelled out you know, what they were going to do. Um, and you see a similar document, with the same title, white, men, you know, white men's uh, declaration of independence that was used by these white Democrats in Wilmington. So this is not, these are not sporadic moments uh, and the federal government could have intervened you know, the federal government could have insisted that these people be brought to trial, um, but that, that didn't happen. Uh, so for all of these reasons, we say the federal government is the culpable party. Uh, and we, will, we can talk maybe a little bit later about them being the capable party to pay reparations to Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Yep. <clears throat> Couldn't agree more. Um, but... There's a bit more to this article, if we continue. Um, the ruling, uh, which is where they're talking about this, the fact that the judge threw this out, right? Um, undercut an effort to seek justice for a rampage by white mobs that burned Tulsa's black neighborhood to the ground. As many as 300 people were killed. Some 35 blacks were leveled and hundreds of home and businesses destroyed. The case originally was filed in September 2020 under the state's public nuisance law. After many twists and turns in August 2022, Wall allowed the lawsuit to continue. Three survivors of the massacre, each over 100 years old, were the most recent plaintiffs in the case. In the filing, the plaintiffs said that they were seeking to abate the public nuisance caused by the rampage in Greenwood and to obtain benefits unjustly received by the defendants as a result of it. The lawsuit quoted, Tulsa Mayor G.T. Bynum, who had said that the racial and economic disparities that still exist in the city can be traced back to that massacre. In the aftermath of this attack, the petition alleged the defendants enacted unconstitutional laws that deprived Greenwood residents of the use of their property and thwarted the community's efforts to rebuild by redirecting public resources to benefit predominantly white areas of Tulsa. The defendants have imposed or supported unlawful policies and actions that stifled the ability of all Greenwood residents impacted by the massacre to rebuild and thrive, the petition said. As remedies, the plaintiffs sought an accounting of the damages caused during the massacre and an order requiring the defendants to replace homes and businesses destroyed during the attack and to return misappropriated land to the black community with interest, hopefully, among other requests. Um... Lawyers representing the survivors plan to appeal the decision, according to a statement from Justice for Greenwood Foundation, the organization founded by Demario Solomon Simmons, one of the plaintiff's lawyers. The dismissal of this case is just one more example of how America, including Tulsa's legacy, is disproportionately and unjustly borne by the black community. The statement read, we will continue to fight on behalf of and alongside our survivors. Lawyers for the city of Tulsa and the Tulsa Regional Chamber argued the three survivors failed to demonstrate they were spe specially injured, uh, separate from all of those who suffered as a result of the attack. Without establishing this, the lawyers argued in motions filed in court last year the plaintiffs couldn't sustain their public nuisance claims. The city lawyers also pushed back against the survivors' unjust enrichment claims, in which they argued the city, county, and regional chamber have economically benefited from the matter, using it to draw tourists. Simply being connected to a historical event does not provide a person with unlimited rights to seek compensation from any project in any way related to that historical event. I'm sure some other people might argue. Uh, uh, pause. Uh, yeah. The That's Japanese. Uh-huh. That's historical. The yeah. Japanese. Yeah. The Jews. Yeah. No offense. Uh -huh. Native Americans. Native Americans. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, not to mention the white slave owners who right. actually got compensation. Right. Um, yeah. Um, right. Anyway, lawyers for the city wrote. And real quick, a, before you go continue, ahead. Reeve, before you continue, speaking the mic. You know, sorry. And you, you know, it talks about a public nuisance. The last time I checked, having your buildings burnt to the ground and your property taken from you which certainly qualifies a public nuisance. It's far more than a nuisance. That's it's destruction of property, more than a assault, murder. 
like you know uh among other things you know our arson like how many things we want to rack up here right um so anyway lawyers for the city wrote they continue uh, if that were the case, every person connected to any historical event could make similar unjust enrichment claims against every museum or point of remembrance. Hmm. Uh, they they sure. have. Exactly. Uh, they have. <laughs> Funny that. Funny how that might be the precedent. Uh, Bynum said Sunday, the city hasn't, re which that says that they're throwing, getting rid of it because of the precedent it would set. That's why they're getting rid of it. That's what they just admitted to right there. Um, so Bynum said Sunday, the city hasn't received the judge's full order and the city is still committed to investing in the Greenwood district, including finding the graves of 1921 Tulsa race massacre victims, which we don't know where all of those are. So, you know, there was like, how many, how many died? 300 or so? Yes. You know, so I'll argue probably more than that, but well, close this out. You know, like thoughts. I know there's many. <laughs> we, we, as, I, <laughs> as I said, the judge should yeah. be hanged. Honestly, the judge should be hanged. You know, like, but uh, on a larger, on a more macro scale. Other than you sharing the story, Reef, I have not heard this on Twitter or in else. the news. Yep. This I should saw, have I been. Saw Jay Buffon, Jared. Right. That's about right. it. Right. And I believe, to my knowledge, Savvy also reported on this. Yep. Right. I think. So, and this is not for this audience because you guys. I mean, I might be talking about you all, but I want to assume the best of you all. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are like Black Lives Matter or still have that in your profile and you mm -hmm. hear stories about such as this and it doesn't make you angry enough that you do not say anything, get rid of it right now. Agreed. Huh? Because I tell you what, we are not going to rely on mainstream media to report on this because it's not going to work in their interest to talk about it. And we know that, and we know that. So moving on. But for independent media, for us, who talks about wanting to bring truth, who want to bring justice to this nation, this is one of those things. And if you remain complicit after, and I'll, I'm going to challenge you all, and I, normally, I give these challenges in joking, but I'm going to be very serious because the, probably this clip is going to be, this will be clipped out. Mm -hmm. Probably by the weekend. Shout out to Fanto, our editor, for yeah. clipping our streams every week. Do your damn job and share this out. And tag us, JB, whichever black independent creator that you know of to this. Yeah. Or white. If you really, or what, what whoever. Not if, or. And. 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 If yeah. you really, <laughs> if you really care about Black Lives Matter, because the idea that this story has not been mentioned in the media at all, especially within our space, but we get to talk, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go off for a second, but we get to talk about all the drama bullshit that doesn't mean anything in light of, and I'm speaking as a Black immigrant who will not benefit from this. Yep. Okay? But I'll be damned if my cousins, my African-American cousins, 
are not going to be entitled to the things that belong to them on account of a few white people who hate black people that much to withhold a promise to them as a result of the bigotry and the lies and the torture and the hell that our ancestors had to go through in the last 500 years. The very least you can do is share this clip out if you care about Black Lives Matter. If you do not, you can remove it, and I don't fucking care. D unsubscribe to this channel right now. I am dead serious. Because it's fun to talk about all the drama and all the kind of stuff and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm speaking because back in 2020, I had a lot of white people who I had not heard from in maybe like a decade call me and ask me, Colin, how are you doing? I haven't heard of these motherfuckers for maybe about that long. But in that white guilt decided to call me because of whatever feelings that they were feeling in light of George Floyd and they thought of me. And guess what? I haven't heard from them since then. Most of them. Do you know the first people who called me in that whole thing? My brothers from Uganda were the first people to check on me and asked me how I was doing. No one from this country. It was my brothers and sisters from Uganda who called me and asked, Uncle Colin, how is everything? We saw what happened. And the first thing I was like, how in the hell did you see this? They said, we saw it online. And I said, I'm glad you did. Because this is what I've been trying to tell you for the last decade that I came to visit you in this country, but due to certain reasons, I could not fully express, and words cannot express the reality of what you've been lied to in terms of the, the, the bullshit that happens in this country that many white people go over there and kind of say these things that make these young youth want to come over here. I told them, you're better off staying there. I understand that it's hard for you, but at least over there, you're among your own. And you can handle it in terms of on your being on your in terms of your culture. You do not want to come here and deal with the bullshit of all this white supremacy that exists in this country. But long story short, I had to have international black people check in on me not my white friends, so-called, so who have known me forever, who checked in on me first. So as I said, do yourself a favor and fucking share this clip once we do, because you're not going to hear, especially any of these Black pundits in mainstream media talking about this, and they will be the first to say, oh, we need white reparations and all this kind of stuff. But they're going to talk about all the drama and all that kind of bullshit, which unfortunately in the independent media that we also talk about, and we get distracted from, you know, talking about stories like this that will be meaningful to Black people in particular. And I'm not sorry that I went off, but I think it is important because when it comes to issues regarding Medicare for All and all these other things... You expect us, especially Black people on the left, to rally for you in terms of those issues. But when it comes to issues like reparations, you guys run away. <laughs> yeah, boy. If you care about my life, if you care about Joe's life, if you care about the people that you care about who happen to be Black, this should be of your concern. And you will share this clip. And you will talk you? to people about this clip. And you know what? I don't need you to be, and I've had these conversations with you. I don't need you all to be an expert. 
on reparations. I just want you to be willing to listen to the reality of what we're asking for and what demands are being made or trying to be made. Because I admit within the Black community, like we need to have a discussion as to what reparations is going to look like and how we can properly demand for it. So that's something we need to handle in-house. And I will admit that. But in the meantime, if you're non-Black and you're listening, do yourself a favor and at least talk to us about the situation and walk in solidarity with us as we figure this out amongst ourselves. And that's all I got to say on it. Perfect. Well said. Well said. And by the way, nicely done with that Street Fighter 2 sound. Sam. Well, <laughs> I think that's well Street done. Fighter 2, Street Fighter 1. Street Fighter 2. Colin, there's not much I really need to add other than you know, reparations are important. Reparations are necessary. Reparations are vital. When you think about the root word of reparations, it's repair. It means to fix. It needs to fix. And we have to fix the problem. We have to fix the 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 damage caused by the greatest crime against humanity in human history, the enslavement of Black people, not just the enslavement of American descendants of Africans, but the enslavement of all Black people across the Caribbean diaspora especially. And I can say this to you, Colin, because you and I have a similar background. You were born in England just like me. You came to America at a relatively young age just like me. The only real difference background-wise between the two of us is both of my parents are from Trinidad. You only have one parent from Trinidad and another parent from Barbados. But essentially, our backgrounds are the same. And as you so accurately said earlier on, my claim and your claim for reparations would not come from the United States government because neither of us are descending from an American, an enslaved African our claims for reparations would come from the British monarchy mm -hmm. because our descendants came from a country that colonized the Caribbean, the Great Britain. There is an organization that I urge everyone to take a look at. It's called CARICOM, C-A-R-I-C-O-M. And we've, and Joe, we've talked about CARICOM on this show and we've sure. mentioned they have demands. They have a 10 point reparations which plan, which we've gone Carcom. through on, which we have talked about on this show. And, yeah. and you say internationalize the struggle. If African Americans, at least, at least, look, I'm not saying in the Caribbean we have our mess together, but at least we have demands. And they're on a website and we know exactly what they are. We don't, we, the least, where's ours in this, in America? Huh? We're asking for reparations. We're not, we don't, we don't even know what we're asking for. So that's what I said, like in terms of us, we need, we will figure that out. We need to figure that out amongst ourselves, but that's a discussion that we need to have in-house. What non-Black people need to do is when we talk about reparations to you, don't just dismiss it. Don't just say it's never going to happen. Don't say you don't deserve it or whatever thing that you're going to say. If you, if black lives really matter to you, then our words should matter to you and what we're saying. And you should be able to help us advocate for those needs. And, and we will take care of the rest. And it's not just a matter well. of words. It's also a matter of action. As I said about two hours ago, because mm -hmm. again, feelings, and emotions only go so far. There has to be action. And I want to go ahead and take about another 30 seconds or so going over what CARICOM reparations 10-point plan actually is. One, full formal apology. Number two, indigenous people's development programs. That's important. Number three, funding for repatriation to Africa. Number four, the establishment of cultural institutions and the return of cultural heritage. Number five, assistance in remedying the public health crisis. Number six, education programs. Number seven, the enhancement of historical and cultural knowledge exchanges. Number eight, 
psychological rehabilitation as the result of the transmission of trauma, which is generational trauma, mind you. Number nine, the right to development through use of technology. And number 10 is debt cancellation and monetary compensation. Now, under each of these 10 bullet points is a description for what the specific demands and general practices are. And at least CARICOMREPARATIONS.org has this 10-point plan, and there is some substance to it. Okay. American yeah. descendants of enslaved Africans and Black people in America, we're not even sure what we should be asking for other for. than the continued demand for reparations. There's demand it and maybe demand. cut the check. That's why I keep hearing. Yeah. We, keep, we, we keep hearing cut the check, but what do we do with that check? It's right. no different. You know, what do we do with that check? There's, and this is way more than just economics. Take a look at what we're talking about here. Technology, repatriation, cultural uh, re repatriation, enhancement of cultural knowledge exchanges. You know, how else are you going to know who you are as a people when your culture was taken from you? When your best, when, when, when your history was whitewashed and rewritten to fit a white narrative. How, how do you know who you are? So Colin, when you tell your cousins you're better off being there, I, I agree with that because the reason why they're better off being there is because at least they know who they are in yeah. Uganda because mm -hmm. they understand what their culture is. They understand who they are historically. They know where they came from. They know who they are. You know, again, I mentioned the song Exodus by Bob Marley hours ago. And Bob Marley also said in that song, we know where we're going. We know where we're from. We're leaving Babylon. We're going to the promised land. They know where they're going because they know where they came from. Black people in America, Black people in America, and I'm talking specifically about, about descendants of Black people, don't know where we're going. And they don't have a plan for reparations. Why? Because historically, we don't know where we are from because they are, their culture was taken from them. It was taken on, on slave ships and whitewashed as of August 20th, 1619. How are you going to know where you're going to go when you don't know where you came from? That's why the caricomreparations.org 10-point plan is so important. And Colin, you'd said this earlier, it's about internationalizing the struggle. I would love to see, and I would love to see the, the beef that Black Americans and Caribbean Americans that seem to have, I would love to see that squashed. Yeah. And I would love to see solidarity between Black Americans and Carib and, and, and Caribbean Americans, especially when it comes to reparations. Right. And again- because it's, a, it's we're tied by that we're tied and, by that. yes and yes there's going to be like there's going to be regional differences of course. that would be unique yes to wherever we got dropped off yes but it's the same imperialistic powers that brought us to where we are Absolutely. today regardless if you're in the caribbean in america in europe or elsewhere. America, it's that same. Yeah. It's still it's still that same imperialistic white supremacist power Absolutely. that brought us here. So Absolutely. and your African Americans movement and success in reparations is only going to help everyone else in the diaspora. So so you need us, <laughs> you know, like, and so that's, I say that because it is to your benefit as a black immigrant to be in solid. I'm saying I want to be in solidarity with you. And I know that for some black people are kind of dismissive of that. And I'm like, you know what, you're really going to dismiss me. <laughs> who's actually trying to help you. Uh-huh. 
get to at minimum a demand for reparations in a way besides money. You know, we talked so, about stuff like universal reparations, right? You know, on this show before. So, so as I said, there's a lot in house among Black people that we need to have. And we will work on that ourselves. But for non-Black people, you know what your role is. Yep. You know, if you yep. want us to continue being solidarity with you with issues that you care about, all we ask is that you be in solidarity with us for issues that we care about, even if you don't necessarily understand it. And how? I rather you did it because then you can be in a position to learn. And yep. and and Colin, something to go along with this. In many instances, the issues that white people want black people to support have have less social footing and less merit than the call for reparations for American descendants of enslaved Africans and reparations for the Caribbean diaspora and any other black people or other people who have been colonized by uh, imperial power. A, a, per, a perfect example of this, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about this, is abortion. Abortion. Right. Okay. Anytime abortion comes up, there's a whole lot of liberal white women that want that want black people to support abortion. This is not about what I think about women's reproductive rights. That's not what this discussion is about. What this discussion is about is a history of abortion and how, quite honestly, if people knew where abortion actually came from, no Black person should support abortion at all, shouldn't support it, because it came from Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist and a white supremacist. She is the, also the architect of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was originally called the Negro Project. And the, the objective of the Negro Project was to terminate Black pregnancies to maintain the superiority of the white race. That is what abortion's initial programming was. So whenever abortion rights are under attack, like we saw a little more than a year ago with Roe versus Wade, there were a whole lot of Black people that stood in solidarity with, quite honestly, liberal white women mm -hmm. for rights. But I, the last time I checked, I didn't see a whole bunch of liberal white women standing alongside Black people when it came to reparations. And right. there's certainly a stronger case to be made for reparations for American descendants of enslaved Africans and reparations for people from the Caribbean diaspora and Africa, as opposed to a single issue such as abortion. There's certainly, and quite frankly, if more white people understood how important reparations are. And again, everything that comes with reparations, including healthcare, mm -hmm. abort, you, you wouldn't need to have abortion as a, you wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily need to be using abortion as a political tool because you would look at abortion for what it really is, which is a form of healthcare rights. As a poor, as, as instead of polit, instead of a political football to be used every few years to garner votes. Mm -hmm. Again, a rising tide floats all boats. A rising tide floats all boats. So if everybody is uplifted, everybody benefits, including black people. Everybody benefits. So that's also why reparations are important. It's also why reparations are important. We talked about, Colin, you said the words truth earlier on, probably about 10 or 15 minutes ago. I used to live in Canada. I understand, at least I have a better understanding of the various indigenous populations across Canada, especially in the British Columbia area, because I understand that there are loads of First Nations communities that are still suffering from the residential schools and the thousands of bodies that were slaughtered as a result of the Catholic Church in these residential schools. 
And there is a commission that the Canadian government created called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But what ended up happening is there wasn't a whole lot of truth and there was no reconciliation, none. And nor were there reparations paid to the not only the survivors of First Nations communities, but the descendants of the First Nations communities. That also the reparations also needs to be paid to them too, because the Canadian government has done them wrong. Reparations should also be paid to our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah. Huh? That needs to take place. When we talk about reparations, and I know, Colin, we both come from a country. We both came. We both come from a country that colonized the descendants of our parents. We both were born in England. They colonized the Caribbean. France needs to take a look at itself in the mirror and start paying yeah. reparations. Right. Same for Belgium. Same for Spain. Germany, same for Spain. Same for Portugal. Portugal. Same for the Netherlands. They need to take a look into this. And this goes to a bigger topic. And I'll have to close with this because I need to get a little bit of sleep. But yeah, Colin, you said during the summer that the people that checked on you during the summer, it wasn't your white friends. It was your brothers from Africa. Mm -hmm. For me, it wasn't necessarily black people in America, nor were it a whole lot, nor was it European people from countries that had a history of colonization. I was being checked on and had and had people look at, you know, see what was going on with me from countries that did not have a history of colonization. My friends in Sarajevo, Bosnia, my friends in Ljubljana, Slovenia, my friends in Zagreb, Croatia, they were the people that checked on me first. Why did they check on me first? I just, again, this is just my way my mind is working. I have a feeling that they checked on me first because number one, their countries don't have a history of colonization. Number two, their countries were all at one point part of a larger country called Yugoslavia. And 30 years ago, they went through a genocide, a war. And they eventually figured out that hating some a group of people that came from that same country is stupid. Hating somebody because they speak a language that is slightly different and they practice a different religion is stupid. So through the process of logical extension, hating somebody because of the color of their skin is also stupid. Maybe that's me because of the wonderful experiences I've had in that part of the world. Maybe that's just my line of thinking. But those are the people that checked on me first. I didn't have a whole lot of people at first from England check on me or some of my German friends check on me right away. Speaking the mic. Sorry. I didn't necessarily have a bunch of my friends from England or Germany check on me right away. It was my people from Eastern Europe that checked on me first because of everything that I just explained. <sighs> this, this is a difficult topic. It's difficult not to discuss because of the facts. It's difficult to discuss because of the emotions. It's difficult. It's an emotionally heavy conversation. It's not a factually difficult conversation to have because the facts are there. The history is there. As long as you're willing to acknowledge it and as long as you're willing to do the research and homework to understand what happened. <sighs> This, I, and Colin, I appreciate everything that you said earlier. This is much bigger than just, hey, acknowledging what happened. There has to be action. Yeah. There has to be action. And there has to be action. And it can't, it, it's past the point of waiting for House Resolution 40 to be signed. So a study for reparations can be called into play. Which by the which the UK has a study. Mm -hmm. We spoke about that on the show. Yep. The UK has a study studying this. Yep. And you're and royal, royal without ties. Yeah. Right. And the royal family has ties to corporations in well, I mean it makes sense, in Virginia. 
Except for, so I'm, except for so, I mean, Prince, Princess Di. She's good. <laughs> you know, but, piece. you know, so I would argue that Black people in other places in the diaspora are way ahead of African Americans here in a lot of ways. I agree. So basically, African Americans need to step up and and again, there is a beef somewhat with African Americans and Black immigrants in this country. And as I said, that's an issue that we need to have in house amongst ourselves. But it's worth it if the idea is we can understand where the commonalities are with reparations, regardless of the region of the world you're from. Right. And having seeing where we can be in solidarity we, with each other on that. And as I say, all we're asking for for our non-Black people who care about us and love us is that you just work in solidarity alongside with us as we figure this out. And don't dismiss it because it's an issue that doesn't necessarily apply to you or you don't understand it or is some of you and I'm going to call some of you out you don't think we deserve it mm -hmm. I, I, I said it yeah I said it and I know some people that's I don't think that's anyone in this audience but some of you on the left do not believe that people don't deserve reparations and to that I could say to you you can kick rocks mm -hmm. I got Colin, you, homie. Don't worry, Colin, I got you. Last, Colin, one last thing. And I know something that I mentioned when I read the 10-point reparation plan from the CARICOM reparations.org website was history. History. Earlier tonight, about a little more than two hours ago, we talked about Israel. We talked about Palestine. And I said probably about 20 minutes ago that the greatest crime against humanity in human history is the enslavement of Africans. Not too far away from that, right alongside, is what happened with Jewish people in Germany. Jewish people in Germany, what happened to them was atrocious. It's horrible. It's disgusting. And we all know what happened there. But, and at the same time, we are constantly reminded of what's happened to Jewish people all the time. And I have no problem with that. In fact, I encourage it. But if our Jewish brothers and sisters are going to constantly remind the world of what happened in Nazi Germany, then I certainly think it's apropos for Black people across the diaspora to remind the world of what happened to Black people over the past five centuries. Because again, if it's about human rights violations, if it's about crimes against humanity, it's about if it's about suffering, if it's about treating people differently because of a different because of where they live or who they where they came from or their religious practices or the color of their skin, then all suffering has intersectionality. All suffering is connected. And if we're going to be constantly reminded about the struggles that Jewish people had to deal with in Nazi Germany, and I do believe that we, that has merit, and we should be reminded of our history, regardless of how sordid it is, then certainly the what happened to enslaved Africans across the diaspora, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in the Caribbean, and definitely in the United States, also deserves the same amount of historical reminding. It also also deserves the same energy. It also deserves the same context when we talk about what happened to Black people over the past 500 years. Best we can do is Juneteenth ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, this has been a great episode. Joe, we appreciate you so much for coming you no made problem. episode Anytime. you made episode 69. go real well 
you know. So you've been waiting to do that all night, weren't you? All night, all night. <laughs> uh, I forgot at the top. Um, yeah. But so, anyway, last, where I mean, we have your information because I know people were like, "We want Joe Nice's info," and all that information is in the description. Description, yeah. but um, but share for the people. Where can people find you? And you're going on tour. You are touring right now. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I, I've been traveling a lot over the past few weeks or so. I just got back into America. Gosh, when was it? Last Friday, I was in Istanbul, Turkey, the first couple of weeks of this month. Played a show out there. Played Kansas City on Saturday. I taught a DJing seminar and then played the show. On Saturday of this week, I'm in Boone, North Carolina. Sunday, I'm playing the Soundhaven Music Festival. Next Saturday is Houston, Texas. Then I need to go to Trinidad for about a week to take care of some business because my dad passed away a while back and I got to take care of some stuff down there. Then it's Mesa, Arizona on the 19th. The 26th is the Fractal Music Festival. It's um it's in Massachusetts. I forget the name. It's in Needham, Massachusetts. So it's about an hour North. It's not just out, it's just Needham. That's just outside Boston. It's like half an hour actually, out. Actually, it's actually nowhere near Boston. Actually, actually, Needham, near, Mass. Needham, yes, yes. I, I, I think that's the name of this town. I think that's the name of the town. It's yeah. about an hour north of Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. Okay. I not sure that. that. I think that's where it is. And then after that, it's the Asia tour. It's the Asia tour. China's already on board, a couple things in Hong Kong, and I'm waiting for a couple other things to kind of shake themselves out. And then right after that, I'm in Europe for about three three to four weeks. So Colin let's yeah. sneak into his luggage. Keep we'll never notice that we're there. <laughs> um, Gonna try to apply to grad school again, this time for a PhD. I, tr I applied for a, the PhD program in musicology at the University of North Carolina. I did not get accepted. Mm -hmm. I understood why, because what they what I wanted to research and what their expertise is, it was two different things. So I'm gonna apply for a PhD in communications at the University of North Carolina this fall and we'll see what happens. If I get accepted, I will become a grad student again and I'll start up in the fall of 2024. So we shall and see what happens. Have to, and people have to call you Dr. DJ Joe. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dubstep, you know. Dr. Dubstep. <laughs> The I think, it's a four, yeah, I think it's a four or five year program. We'll see. But nice. I, I I want to continue my education because you know I, I've I've been involved in a musical culture that has given me so much. And I feel I need to contribute in some way. And not just with me playing shows or me learning how to make music and putting out my own music now. But what I also want to do is make sure that I contribute to the culture in some meaningful way and i already know what i want to research i already know what i want to talk about it's just a matter of gaining acceptance into the school and then being able to do the coursework which is no problem and then write up something that makes sense then a few years down the line dr nice yeah, we'll see what happens where college people... abroad is a thing as well but yeah tell people where they can find you thank you Look, I'm everywhere. Just, you know, Joe Nice DJ, J O E N I C E D J on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, MixCloud, Threads, which I barely use, but whatever, it's Threads. It's another social media platform. That's it. That's it. I'm still trying to revamp the whole merch website, Joe Nice DJ.net. I need to find a new printer that can print up a lot of the designs that I have right now. But right. that's that's what I've got going on. So that's where I am. I'm around. I want to thank everybody that decided to spend two hours and 20 minutes watching us talk about a variety of topics. It's important. And Reef and Colin, I especially want to thank you brothers for doing everything that you all do because it's important. It's a labor of love. It's, it's a necessity. It's a public service. And it's not just a job. At least I feel it's not a job for, for each of you. It's a responsibility. It's yep. a response. You know, I, I said the words truth and reconciliation not too long ago. And I feel that it's it's a job to tell the truth. It's a job to speak the truth. It's a job to continually breathe life into truth. 
And just like scripture says, the truth will set you free. And hopefully, as long as you brothers keep telling the truth and reporting, not telling stories, but reporting on what's happening out in the, in the world and letting people know that what's happening in the world in some place that you've never heard of, if you've never been to, to people you will never meet, could and most likely will affect you some in some way it's important to tell that there's what's happening it's rep it's important to report on those situations it's necessary you brothers are necessary and i couldn't be happier and proud to be involved with you guys especially on a conversation like tonight in, in this space yep. and, and for anybody that's watching on youtube right now and if you watch the podcast later on next week or wherever that's awesome but again, if there's any way you can contribute, either financially or a, a retweet, a share of the video on Facebook, a comment in, 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 in the chat, in the live chat, a super chat, a thumbs up, an emoji, whatever it is, an order to, a, to DoorDash so Colin can get some roti and some polloi from a good Trinidadian yeah, place. <laughs> I'm down for that. Right? Right? You know what it is. You know what it is. Whatever it is, anything that any, all contributions are important. All contributions matter because the work that these brothers are doing, it matters. It's important. 